Welcome to NAC TV Reads the News. My name is Kathy McGrath, and I'm one of the many volunteers that help create programming for our station. NAC TV can be seen on MTS Channel 30 or 1030, Westman Cable Channel 117, Bell Satellite Channel 592, or online at nactv.tv. These programs are made possible by our volunteers, staff, advertisers, as well as donations made by you, the viewers. If you are enjoying your NAC TV experience, please consider supporting us by either donation or volunteering. You can contact our office at 204-476-2639 or at nactv at wcgwave.ca. And on with the news. Today is Friday, March 4th, 2022. And on the front page is a story of the Ukraine. People have lost sight what freedom means. Local Ukrainian-Canadian couple share perspective on Russian invasion. Pictured is Nipua resident Ernie Gwaziak and Pat Gwaziak have deep Ukrainian roots. Their grandparents moved to Canada from Ukraine and they know several families who have moved from Ukraine and some who are still over there. This is by Kira Patterson. While the whole world seems to be on the edge of their seats watching what unfolds in Ukraine since Russia launched an invasion last week, there are many Ukrainian Manitobas who have a vested interest in what the outcome will be. Pat Gwaziak and her husband Ernie have deep Ukrainian roots. Their grandparents immigrated to Canada in the early 1900s from Ukraine, but they have also many friends who moved to Manitoba from Ukraine and know a few still living over there. It's scary, Gwaziak said of the Ukrainian crisis. It's been an ongoing thing, she added. We visited there in 2012 and we just felt the internal unrest at the time, and that's 10 years ago. She also noted that she's recently been in contact with many of her Ukrainian expat friends to let them know she's thinking of them. She also had some updates from friends who still have family in, the, in Ukraine. Real stories from people on the ground. I talked to a mum yesterday, she lives in Morden now, and we visited her daughter and son-in-law when we were there, and they live in Kyiv, she shared. And she, the mum, was telling them a month ago to leave, and they said, well, no, because they have teaching jobs and whatever. And then, three days ago, their daughter phoned the mum in the middle of the night here and said they were leaving. This is continued. Pictured as Pat and Ernie Gwazik visiting Ukraine in 2012 to see and experience where their grandparents came from. This picture was taken by the sign for the village where Pat's paternal grandparents lived. Gwazik noted that the couple got a ride to the Polish border, but Poland wasn't allowing men between the ages of 18 and 60 to cross because Ukraine has asked them to stay and help in the fight. So the women didn't go either, but they are staying with some relatives close to the Polish, Polish border in western Ukraine, Gwaziak added. So that lady in Morden said that she hasn't slept. She said that they are currently farther away from the invasion, but she's not sure how long it'll be before the Russian offensive closes in. And right as we speak, there's a couple right here from Nipawa that went to attend the funeral of his mum a couple of weeks ago, and now they are underground in Kyiv. Gwaziak shared, everything is changing by the hour. So I heard from them, maybe Friday, and they said at that point they were safe, but they were underground. She added that they can't get a flight out of Kyiv because air traffic is grounded, and it's a long drive to get to the border, so she's not sure how so soon they'll be able to get back home to Nipua. Ukrainians are not the only ones affected. Gwazit expressed that she feels for all the people involved in this crisis, not just those in the Ukraine. The saddest part is, besides all the Ukrainian suffering, the Russian people are suffering too, she shared. I feel for the Russian common people because they are going to live with a stigma. 
She noted that even today she hears of people from German descent having to live with the stigma carried over, over from the Second World War, and she's afraid Russian people may face similar hostility after this invasion. I hope that when this is over, that we don't bristle when we see somebody that's of Russian descent, she stated. I hope that people understand that it's not the everyday Russian that's after this war, it's those that are in abuse of power. Canadians need to be reminded of what freedom is. Another sentiment that the Ukraine situation brought up in Gwaziak was her frustration with the Canadians who have been claiming their freedoms are being taken away by the governments here. People have lost sight of what freedom means, she stated. There were people saying, we need freedom or we want freedom and freedom for our children. Well, let's take a look at Ukraine, she expressed. My hope is that people have woken up to the fact to realize what freedom is, because I think we don't have a clue here. We're just so entitled and we're so me that we have no idea of what it is, she added. It just makes me sad that we don't think we have freedom. How to help. Gwazik shared that the Ukrainian people are in need of support. She has helped in any way she can from sending messages of love, prayers and support to those she knows affected by the crisis, to sending money to help buy much needed supplies for the refugees. They need milk for babies. They need, they need, they need. There's millions of them leaving the country, Gwazik expressed. She stated that she's transferred a donation to someone she knows who's collecting money to send to Ukraine. She added that there are lots of other fundraisers, but people should be careful to make sure it's legitimate before donating. The Ukrainian Canadian Congress is one credible organization, Gwazi excited, that has been collecting donations through the Ukrainian, Ukraine Humanitarian Appeal. People can visit ucc.ca to donate there. The Canadian Red Cross has also started a Ukraine humanitarian crisis appeal. The Canadian government pledged to match donations up to 10 million, and that amount has already been reached, but the Red Cross is still accepting donations. To donate or find more information on their fundraise, visit donate.redcross.ca. And now into some more local news. Nipua acquires trio of icicles. Partners with Yellowhead Centre to create a new winter activity option. This is by Owen Devereaux. Three icicles were recently acquired by the town of Nipua from Spark Rental Inc. of Winnipeg. And they are pictured here. Nipua has an exciting new way for everyone to make the most of winter. On Thursday, February 24th, Representatives with the town, as well as the Yellowhead Centre, unveiled three recently received ice cycles. These bicycles have been modified for use on ice by replacing the front wheel with a pair of closely aligned ice skate blades. It also has a roll guard attached at the base to ensure it will not tip over, making it essentially usable to anyone regardless of their skill level as a cyclist. Director of Recreation Services for the town of Nipawa, Nicole Cooper, told the Banner and Press that the inspiration for, the, for pursuing these bikes was sparked through a TV news broadcast earlier this year. Someone in our office saw them on CTV News. A company called Spark Rental, based out of Winnipeg, had manufactured them, so they sent me a link and said, this would be cool, said Cooper. So I just sat on the idea for a while because they are $2,000 per bike. But then the opportunity with Healthy Together Now came along. Healthy Together Now is a grant program distributed through Prairie Mountain Health that has four intakes annual. So I applied for one of the grants in February and we were lucky enough to get all the three of the bikes for free. Cooper said that the icicles will be put to use in the Yellowhead Centre in some type of capacity. I originally wanted to do a program called Coffee, Cycle and Socialize that's geared towards older adults during the week. It's just that a lot of the streets are icy during the winter, along with cold temperatures. That can make it difficult to many to go out and exercise. So this provides something that they could come, have a coffee, take a bike ride and get some exercise and visit with their friends, Cooper indicated. 
Yellowhead Centre Director of Operations, Lindsay DeHolas, stated that the coffee concept, along with several other ideas, are being pursued. DeHolas added that she is excited about the potential programming options these bikes provide them. This could be a new way to get people out and get active who may not necessarily skate. So the bike program is a great opportunity and with the coffee it's also going to have special social aspect to it. To get people out and hopefully in the future we can get more bikes and get more people to try them out. I think it's a great opportunity, Tehola said. The week before Nicole contacted me regarding the ice cycles, I saw a news story on television about them in use down at the Forks and I thought those would be so cool to have. Then all of a sudden Nicole contacted me and I jumped on board right away. So yeah, I'm excited about it. Cooper and DeHolis are hopeful that some type of schedule for the ice cycles can be arranged before the Yellowhead's ice operations are concluded for the season. If not, a program will be instituted into the Yellowhead Center weekly schedule for the 2022-2023 season. And a final concert to close the Kaleidoscope season, submitted by the Kaleidoscope Concerts. Pictured is the Chris Giordani Band will close out the Kaleidoscope season with a concert upstairs at the Nipua Legion on April 23rd. This will replace the Bromantics concert scheduled for March 10th. It has been a difficult time for any organization attempting to plan concerts for the past few years. Kaleidoscope's concerts in Nipua is no exception. All concerts were cancelled for the 2020-21 season. The 2021-20 season started off on a positive note as three concerts were held at the Roxy in November, December and January. Unfortunately, the Manitoba Theatre Centre cancelled their tour, which included a February date in Nipua. With restrictions set to ease on March 15th, the last concert of Kaleidoscope season was to be the Saskatchewan-based Bromantics, playing the Roxy on Thursday, March 10th. The Kaleidoscope Board decided to postpone that date to late April, but unfortunately the timeline did not work for the Bromantics. Instead, Kaleidoscope is pleased to present a Brandon-based band, the Chris Gigdani Band, upstairs at the Legion on Saturday, April 23rd at 7.30 p.m. Kaleidoscope board member Ron Nordstrom noted that it has been difficult planning for any kind of entertainment for the past two years. With health restrictions in place, our audience this, is, this year have had to show proof of vaccination and wear a mask for the duration of our concerts. We have had a dramatic decrease in attendance, which was most notable at our last concert on January 11th, said Nordstrom. We are so pleased we have local sponsors who understand the importance of the arts and entertainment for the well-being of the community. Sponsors are so important to Kaleidoscope as they help keep ticket prices affordable. We would like to thank all our sponsors for this season. The specific sponsors for this final concert are Rob Smith & Son Backhoe and Trucking, Nipua Gladstone Co-op and Harris Pharmacy. Any individual or sponsor who has tickets from our cancelled MTC play or cancelled Bromantics concert can use these tickets to attend the April 23rd concert. And Home Buddies by Rita Friesen. You know it's been a true Manitoba winter when minus 14 degrees Celsius with no wind brings to mind strong thoughts of spring. Helping that thought is the individual posting on social media the official countdown to the first day of spring and having younger than me women sharing that their walk, the, their walk they spotted in gorge buds on the willow trees and having my sister from the Carmen area tell me with authority that the crows are back. Taking all these things into consideration, hope springs for an earlier than some years spring. The winter of 21-22 will be remembered for the amount of snow, yes, and also for the many days and nights of howling wind. It feels like Mother Nature exhales a deep sustained breath from the north, only to draw back and repeat the action from the south, or east, or west. This winter, I have shoveled the tops of the banks edging my drive so that I can clear the top when I next clear the drives. Full body workout more times than I prefer to schedule. And thankful every time 
that I have the strength and energy and assistance in completing this repetitious task. The town crew blessed me by pushing back the snow at the end of the front drive, allowing me more than a tunnel access to the street. This winter I have not worked on any jigsaw puzzles, only completed two quilts, read a few books and walked, and longed for spring and freedom from heavy jackets and safety boots. I'm encouraged by my gardening friends sharing photos of their crow, crow ops, the glowing grow lights and plastic coverings, the care and attention to healthy growth, a blessing of encouragement and promise. Among the books on the bedside table are, for better or worse, many Charlie Brown cartoons and one on the life and work of Mother Teresa. This later book is slow, reflective and perfect for pre-sleep reading. Woman who at one time was known as the most powerful woman in the world, recipient of a Nobel Peace Prize and a humble servant of her God, one who followed faithfully a call she distinctly heard and then for decades worked tirelessly in answer to that call. Even though there were no more divine messages, she worked in and with faith. Doing research now, we find detractors to her work, as with so many people who accept responsibility and leadership. The voice of the detractors does not silence the message of loving and serving those in need of love and care. For me, this long winter, the inspiration comes from one person who, to the best of her ability, does the task that lies before her, smiling and gracious. I want to be that person in my world. Spring is coming. With it will come opportunities for gathering with friends and neighbours. With it will come gardens of flowers and vegetables. Note this year's flowers triumph in the list. My soul, spirit, longs for colour and movement, more than white snow driven over a white landscape. In all these thoughts, I rest in the knowledge that I am not alone. Here's some thumbs up and thumbs down. Thumbs up to Blair Chapman for a thoughtful and concise letter to the editor in February 18th. You read my mind from R. Bjornsson and Carberry. Thanks up to the RM of Langford greater crew in this year of endless snow clearing. Your ged dedication to our rural roads is appreciated from Dale and Katie F. And thumbs up to the kind young lady who paid for the barbecue chicken on Friday, February 26, between 1 and 3 p.m. at the Safeway, as I had omitted to put money in my pockets. Many thanks. From Joan Kitson. And Helen Drysdale's getting our salivatory glands rolling with blueberry muffins. I'll read her introduction. Blueberry muffins. First Nations peoples have been eating blueberries or starberries long before settlers arrived. The First Nations people ate them fresh, dried, used the juice to cure coughs and to dye cloth and baskets and made a tea from them. Blueberries grow naturally across many provinces in Canada. I've been fortunate to have picked and eaten wild blueberries in British Columbia, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Ontario, and Nova Scotia. In 2019, Canada was the largest producer of wild blueberries, mainly in Quebec and the Atlantic provinces. Canadian production of wild blueberries has decreased due to the more profitable cultivated high bush blueberries. Wild blueberries are still my favorite. Blueberries are bursting with flavor and high in nutrients, antioxidants, fiber, and vitamins. Frozen blueberries are a great option when fresh berries are not in season. I love them frozen as a snack, and studies have shown that they improve cognitive thinking and boost memory skills. I need all the help I can get in that department. Be sure to stew the blueberries into your baking gently. If you beat or mix the batter too roughly, the blueberries will burst and the batter will come purple. And she has included a recipe for oatmeal orange blueberry muffins if anybody wants to get hold of her. So, we continue. MP Dan Mazier conducts local business round table by Ken Waddell. Dauphin Swan River Nipua Member of Parliament Dan Mazier, Mazier held an online local business roundtable on February 25th. The MP's office had earlier reached out to local chambers of commerce for participants and a respectable number, about 20 people, participated in an hour-long discussion. 
Mazier invited MP Tracy Gray of BC, the CPC shadow critic for small business, to lead the discussion. Gray is also a small business owner in her own right and, a very, ab and very ably led the discussion and heard concerns from local business people. The discussion covered topics like support services, gas prices, supply chain issues, business recovery from COVID-19, electricity and natural gas rates, and availability. Asked by a participant as to what a conservative government would do, Gray quickly summarized the key points she would like to see happen. Government should stop printing money and feeding inflation. Present a plan to end the pandemic mandates. Get all sectors of the economy going and not have any pet projects. Sign a softwood lumber deal with the United States. Stop tax increases. Cut red tape and encourage interprovincial trade. Spruce Plains RCMP investigated a fatal house fire by the Banner staff. An investigation is underway into the cause of a fatal house fire in the RAM of West Lake Gladstone. Spruce Plains RCMP reported that on February 27th at around 6.30 p.m., police responded to a fire at a rural residence on Road 71 West. The initial investigation has found found that family members arrived at the house and noticed flames coming from the building. One of the family members immediately went inside, found an injured 24-year-old male and pulled him out of the structure. There was no one else in the residence at the time of the fire. The 24-year-old who was removed from the house was pronounced deceased at the scene. As of the banner and press publication deadline, Spruce Plains RCMP, along with the Office of the Fire Commissioner, continue to investigate the exact cause of the fire. RCMP have indicated, however, that it does not appear to be suspicious. Bull sale kicks off in Nipua. Do we have a bidder? The Brookside Angus 2022 Bull and Select Female Sale took place on February 23rd at the Nipua Agricultural Society Complex by Kira Patterson. One of Nipua's first bull sales of the season has come and gone, with many more to follow this year. Brookside Angus, located in Brookdale, Manitoba, held their 2022 Bull and Select Female Sale on Wednesday, February 23rd at the Nipua Agricultural Society Complex. Derek Palatic, owner of Brookside Angus, said that the sale went better than expected, considering the challenges the agricultural sector has faced this past year. I'd say it was pretty good for the tough year everyone had, he shared. It was better than my expectations. Brookside had 50 year yearling bulls and five yearling heifers on offer at the sale. Palatic noted that there were only a few animals towards the end of the sale that didn't get sold. The highest price of the day was 10500 while the lowest was 3250 Overall, Palatic said the prices he got were lower than previous years. If you calculate in terms of what everybody was paying for feed this year, it dropped less than I expected, he added. He said that considering the drought causing a shortage of feed for farmers, plus the extremely cold temperatures adding to the challenges this winter, the turnout for the sale was fairly good. In terms of how many buyers came out to the auction, it was fairly similar in person numbers to what they had last year, which was just under 50. A pretty good online turnout added to the buyer pool. I'd say over a third of the bulls sold online, Platic noted. He stated that while he brought his best group of bulls yet, Mother Nature had the final say in how the year went. I hope the weather smartens up and we can have a better year for all farmers, both grain and cattle. And here's a Carberry 4-H Beef Club speech results and pictured as the Carberry 4-H Beef Beef Club concluded its speech event on February 8th by Madison Nicolishian. Carberry 4-H Beef held their speeches on February 28th, 2022. Congratulations to all the members for a job well done. Virtual presentation. Intermediate, first place Abby Jackson. Junior, first place Lucas Bilgensky. Speeches. Intermediate, first place Taylor Unraw. Second place. Riley Unra, Junior, first place Abby Snowden, second place Brooke Unra. 
Cloverbud, first place, Madison Nicolition, second place, Brianna Snowden, third place, Brooklyn Holiday, fourth place, Kale Unruh. Judges were Ron Christensen and Darlene McDonald. And here we have Looking Back. 1984, Boy Scouts celebrate 75th anniversary. And Pictured is celebrating Boy Scouts Week in Canada by cutting the 17th anniversary cake in 1982. Were, from left to right, Curtis Karuk, Colin Miller, and Bobby Birch. Along with them were about 100 parents, Cubs, Scouts, and Beavers at the annual Parents' Supper. And this is by Casper Wareham, 110 years old, March 1st, 1912. Senator Choquette's motion to abolish the Canadian Navy was defeated by a heavy vote. 100 years ago, William Jonathan Demamby, a pioneer barrister of Brandon, died this week. The seventh annual poultry exhibition of the Nipah Poultry Association opened on February 28th and closing on March 2nd was a splendid one from point of exhibits. No better display of barnyard fowl, fowl having been shown in Nipah on any previous occasion. Inspection of all imported bees has been asked for and it is suggested that they be vaccinated and otherwise guarded against hives. Jack Yeats of Gwyn and Simpson Marble Works has gone to Portage where he will take up duties in the main shop. His family will follow in a week or two. Ninety years ago, a 10-year-old boy who escaped from a home in Winnipeg last week beat his way on freight trains as far as McGregor and on Wednesday he attempted to hold up the bank there with a toy pistol. 80 years ago, congratulations to Mrs. Ager who celebrated her 77th birthday Monday of this week. Private Galvin Burton, who is in training in Portage, was a weekend visitor at his home. 70 years ago, Thirteen rinks entered the one-day bond spiel held last Thursday at the curling rink. Two local winks won first and second prize. Skips were Ernie Wiley and Ronald Birch. Nipah's first drive-in lunch bar and automobile service station will open for business Friday, March 7th, located on the west side of Humber 4 Highway on the town's western extremity. The new business, known as Evans Motors, will be a mecca for motorists. Sixty years ago, Nipua dog owners are being given one more week in which to purchase licenses and obtain rabies inoculations for their pets before the town starts on a campaign to cure, clear up strays. Notice has been given that beginning March 14th, any dog not wearing the current year's license and rabies tags will be impounded and subject to the penalties set out in the town's dog bylaw. Eight Manitoba localities, including two Arden, have been proclaimed as historic sites by the provincial government. Notice of this action being contained in the February 19th issue, 19th issue of the Manitoba Gazette. This action means that all unauthorized investigation and excavation on these sites is prohibited. The two sites at Arden are identified, at, identified as the Linear Mound, about a mile south of the village, and Arden Campsite on the southern fringes of the village. Surveyed locations are the northeast quarters of sections 12 and 13, respectively, in Township 15 or Range 14. Fifty years ago, Prime Minister Pierre Elliott Trudeau will visit Manitoba May 26 and tour eastern and western constituencies, it was announced Friday. At a meeting of the school board, May 2nd, it was decided to hire Reed Jones and Christofferson, a firm of consulting engineers, to prepare a report on the physical soundness of Viscount School in Nipua for the purpose of much needed renovation. The next step will depend on the engineer's report. Forty years ago, work on Kinsman's Court is progressing on schedule with cement now poured and framing beginning. Anyone watching the building will see rapid progress from now until finish sometime in the fall. Mr. and Mrs. Jack Schmidt of Third Crossing Manor Gladstone celebrated their 63rd anniversary on Saturday, February 13th. The happy couple was married in a Lutheran church in Winnipeg in 1919. 30 years ago, Mr. and Mrs. Thomas Kasprick of Rivers celebrated their 64th anniversary on January 18th with all family present. And 20 years ago, 
The Kelwood and Area Skating Rink held their annual Skate-a-thon on February 24th with 25 skaters on the ice. All those taking part received a participation medal and special awards went to oldest skater, Alison Turner, youngest skater, Tyson Mallett, skater with the most pledges, Dalton Gilmore. After expenses, the Skate-a-thon netted just over $1,600. Good job, kids. And here we have local faith community coming together for the Ukraine. And pictured as Nipua's St. John the Baptist Ukrainian Catholic Church by Kira Patterson. The community is coming together to show support for Ukrainians both close to home and in Europe. The Nipua ministerial, ministerial representing most of the churches in Nipua is planning a prayer vigil at the Ukrainian Catholic Church in Nipua at 11 a.m. on Tuesday, March 8th. Reverend Chad McCharles, cha chair of the ministerial, noted that all are welcome to attend the vigil. Reverend McCharles stated that because the Ukrainian Catholic Church in town is currently without a priest, the ministerial felt that they should take on the task. It will be a time of prayer, scripture reading, personal reflection, stated McCharles. He added that while will be quiet prayer and group prayers, they will also be lighting candles. I grew up in a Ukrainian community up in Shoal Lake, so it hit me hard personally, McCharles shared of his feelings on the Russian invasion of Ukraine. He noted that with the large contingent of people of Ukrainian heritage in the community here, he felt it was important to show support for them during the difficult time. St. John the Baptist Ukrainian Catholic Church is located at the corner of Mountain Avenue New and Elizabeth Street in the north end of Nipua. And here we have NAC Hope organized draw at food drive for Nipua Food Bank. And pictured is Michelle Young of NACI snapping a picture of the members of the Hope Group after they had collected 325 pounds of food on February 27th by Owen Devereaux. 325 more pounds of food is on the shelves of the local food bank today, thanks to the Nipua Area Collegiate Hope, Helping Our World Pursue Equality group. The student group, in collaboration with the NACI Tigers, organized a food drive for the hockey team's final regular season home game on February 27th. All the non-perishables and other proceeds gathered were then donated to the Nipua Community Ministries Center Salvation Army. In total, 325 pounds of food and $275 in monetary donations were collected. NACI teacher and staff facilitator for the HOPE group, Michelle Young, told the Banner and Press that students had recently seen an online post from the food bank requesting support. She said that immediately inspired them to jump to action. They saw the posts that the Salvation Army had made with their most needed list, we recently held a HOPE meeting on February 16th and discussed it. We decided to put a committee together and the kids really just pulled this off through social media posts and poster. They asked the Tigers hockey team if they'd be willing to allow us to set up here for the final home game. And they were supportive, st stated Young. I think it was excellent support we've seen from this considering the short amount of time to pull this together. And we're appreciated of, of all who came out and supported this cause. P. Baker Backhoe, new owner of Provost Signs, and pictured is Provost Signs, located at 200 Airport Road in Nipua. The business was recently sold by Doug Trenenko to Pat and Tara Baker of P. Baker Backhoe. This is by Casper Wareham. Nipua's Provost Signs has changed hands. Doug Chernenko, the now former owner, has sold the business to co-owners Tara and Pat Baker of P. Baker Backhoe. Chernenko spoke to the Banner and Press about the sale on February 28th, noting the preparation for retirement as the reason for the change of ownership. We've worked closely together over the years and it just seemed to be the right fit, Chernenko explained. Provost Signs moved in with P. Baker Backo about 20 years ago, so there won't be any bumps on, in the road as far as transition goes. The Provost Stein staff is still here and our capabilities are still the same, so we're just going to carry on carrying on. Prior to moving in with, our, with P. Baker Backo at the Nipua Industrial Park, Provost Signs had been located along Highway 16 at 525 Main Street East. 
On March 1st, Tara Baker explained that the move to the industrial park was a collaboration, Pat and Doug having purchased the building together. Doug was looking to slow down and the building came up for sale. We've been working so closely ever since, so buying Provost signs just seemed like the right fit in that regard, said Tara. And, of course, we didn't want to see this local business go. Provost Signs has a solid history in Nipua, starting with the original owner, Barney Provost. Provost started the business in 1954 and stuck with it right until May of 1983. At that time, Lionel and Jacqueline purchased the business and remained co-owners until 1999. That's when Chernenko came into the picture. I had been working for the Yellowhead Arena previously, and I just thought it was time to move into something else, Chernenko said, recalled, so I thought I'd try my hand at this. That means, with this latest change of hands, Tara and Pat are the fourth individuals to hold ownership of the business. It doesn't fit with our current business. It's very different, Tara laughed. But Doug is here for the time being, teaching me different things to do with the sign business. My plan is to basically be in the office to take care of the business and then potentially look for new prospects to work here in the future. With the purchase being so fresh, possible opportunities for the future are still being discussed. However, Tara encouraged everyone to take a look at the services Provo Science offers, saying, we can do anything and we're new, learning new things every day. We can make business signs, pylon, fascia, highway, personalized signs for fun, custom orders for all shapes, sizes and colors, Decals for your vehicles, equipment, boat, camper or wall, for example, banners, magnet stamps, custom logos, and the whole lot more. Nipawa Rotary Club supports Shelter Box Initiative by Owen Devereaux. The Rotary Club of Nipawa recently donated to a global program that provides emergency shelters to families in need. The local branch provided around $1,200 to Shelterbox to deliver emergency kits to countries facing disaster. Shelterbox is a program which was started in Great Britain in 2000 to provide emergency shelter to families who have lost their homes, either due to disaster or conflict. The package of materials are sent in a box about the size of a small storage bin and include a tent, several household items and cooking supplies. According to the Shelterbox website, they reached the milestone of supporting 2 million people in 2021. In 2020, the program helped over 200,000 people in 11 different countries. Nipua Rotary Club member Wayne Jacobson said that locally they have previously contributed to the Shelterbox program. Rotary partners with Shelterbox is one of its fundraising arms, stated Jacobson. Nipuha has been involved for a number of years, so we do donate these funds every year. And I really think it speaks to seeing beyond your own community and seeing that you can make a difference in the world. And this does not make a difference, and this does make a difference in people's lives. Jacobson stated that each Rotary Club can request that their donation be for a specific certain location. For Nipua, it requested the Philippines, which dealt with severe typhoons in 2021. He said the bond shared between Nipua and its local Filipinos community made the move very significant. We were able to sponsor one kit, which is one family, who will now have home safety and security at a time of uncertainty. And when you have all other Rotary Clubs stepping up to support one or more of these shelter boxes, then it becomes significant, noted Jacobson. Anyone interested in learning more or donating to Shelterbox can go online to shelterboxcanada.org or speak to a local, local Rotary Club member. Beautiful Plains Museum enters the World Wide Web by Kira Patterson. And pictured above is the home page of the Beautiful Plains Museum brand new website, which went live recently. The website features a digital gallery event listing, and more. The beautiful Plains Museum in Nipua now has an online presence. Their brand new website recently went live online as well as a new Facebook page. It's quite exciting just to be online, expressed museum board member Helen Drysdale. She noted that they'd been planning to get themselves on the web since last summer with their efforts to acquire a new computer. 
Brenda Krischuk from the Beautiful Plains Community Foundation talked to me about an Arts and Cultural St Sustainability Fund grant, Drysdale explained. She noted that Krischuk helped them along with the application process for the grant, which allowed the mu museum to purchase the computer. A great opportunity. One of the museum's new board members, Winona Babbitt, was able to help make the website a reality. Babbitt noted that she used her downtime during the pandemic to take some courses and spend time learning how to create websites and get more of an online presence. Originally, she got into it to put her parents' two businesses online, but she realized she could also use the new skill to give back to the community. Once I was on board and we started talking about a new website, it was such a great opportunity because we have no connection to the community right now, Babbitt shared. Why don't I use what I've learned and give back to the community? Because that's what it's all about. Babbitt started working on the new website at Christmas time and it was ready to launch in mid-February. Their Facebook page will, went live in late January. The new website will allow the museum to share more up-to-date information. We can communicate with the public, we can share things and have discussions. We want to do some videos and there's so much more we'd like to add, but we're trying to keep it simple at this point, Babbitt explained. They will be able to post coming events and their hours of operation, feature certain artifacts, even accept donations online. Currently, they have six museum artifacts featured on the website. Babbitt noted that they have plans to rotate through the items in the museum and have featured different ones each month. On the Facebook page, they've posted several photos from the files of the prairie life in the years past. Babbitt noted that some of the photos they've shared have garnered a lot of attention and discussion, which is wonderful to see. It's going to be an experiment to see where it goes, she said. Drysdale stated that they have lots of plans for more content to go on both the website and the Facebook page. They'd love to get some seniors to make presentations or do demonstrations with older items that they would have used when they were younger. In addition to having features like that online, they'd also like to have in-person events with those types of presentations. Always happy to get volunteers. In the offline world, the museum board and volunteers have been rearranging some of the space in the building, creating a more open area in the entrance for larger groups to be able to gather. They're also working on smaller projects. Drysdale noted that there are a lot of quick projects that volunteers could get involved in if they didn't like to donate some time. In addition to looking for handy volunteers for projects, they're also looking for people willing to make presentations about some of the artifacts in the museum. And of course, they're always happy to accept more board members. Drysdale noted that board members can be involved as much or as little as they feel they are able. Babbitt added, we're happy with any participation. People can find the website at the beautifulplainsmuseum.ca and the Facebook page is called Beautiful Plains Museum. For more information, people can reach out via the museum's brand new email address, beautifulplainsmuseum at gmail.com. And here is a beautiful spread of the Nipua Titans 2021-2022 team roster. Uh, it includes players from all over Canada and also the coaches are featured on it. Uh, it's nice to see the community welcoming these young men and helping feed their passion for their hockey and I think it's a great idea. Nipua Minor Hockey Win Provincial Championship. Female under 11 Titans defeated Hamiota in gold medal game by Owen Devereaux. The Nipua female under 11 Titans closed off a dominant weekend on the ice in Hamiota with a huge win in the final of the Hockey Manitoba Rural B Provincial Championship. The Titans upended the Hamiota Huskies in the championship game on Sunday, February 27th by a score of 4-2. to two. With the victory, Nipa was a perfect 4-0-0 in tournament games, defeating McDonald, Rat River, and Brandon on their way to the title. And pictured is, is the Nipua Titans female under 11 team after winning the Rural B Provincial Championship in Hamiota. And they all look pretty happy about that. Nipua Titans already playing in a best of seven series. 
looking at, remember, at remaining MJHL regular season games differently by Owen Devereaux. To get the playoffs, the Nipua Titans have to start playing every game, every period, and perhaps every shift with a playoff mindset. That's the assessment from the head coach and general manager, Ken Pearson, as the club prepared for the, its last seven games of the MJHL regular season. As of Wednesday, March 1st, the Titans were two points back of the final playoff spot in the West Division. Fortunately, Nipo also has a game in hand on the team they're trying to catch, the Swan Valley Stampeders. Pearson said, however, that there's no excuse for the players to take any of the remaining games lightly. Our playoffs basically have already started, including the Tuesday, March 1st game against Dauphin. We have seven games to play, and if we win four of those games, I think we could put ourselves in a playoff position. We may need some help, but created this situation ourselves, and we just have to deal with what we have control over. The challenge became a little more difficult for Nipua after they lost a pair of games over the weekend in OCN against the Blizzard. Pearson said they just have to put those results behind them, along with anything else happening in other games these last two weeks of the season, and focus on what's next for Nipua. We can't control what's happening elsewhere on the schedule. We can just control our games. Obviously, we have to put the work in and execute, and we'll have success. Nipua's remaining schedule includes games against the Dauphin Kings on March 4th and 5th. After that, the Titans will face Weiweisi Kappa Wolverines in a four-game series, with Nipua's last regular season home game scheduled for Friday, March 11th. Gladstone Cartwright set to advance to the THHL East Division Final by Owen Devereaux. The Gladstone Lakers and Cartwright Clippers have thus far duplicated the regular season success in the Tiger Hills Hockey League's THHL postseason. As of the Banner and Press publication deadline on Wednesday, March 2nd, both teams held two games to zero leads in the respective Eastern Division semi-final season. The Lakers held an advantage over the division's sixth seed, the Wawanisa Jets. Gladstone collected an 8-2 win on Friday, February 25th, and then followed up the next night with a 6-4 victory. Offensive cornerstones, Jory Geddes, Sean Kubas, and Scott Glennie are leading the way for the Lakers. In the other East Division semifinal, the Cartwright Clippers lead two games to zero over Minnesota Bombers. The Clippers claim 6-2 and 5-4 victories over the Bombers over the weekend. Meanwhile, in the THHL's Western Division, the Boys of Ain Border Kings lead their best of five series 2-0 over the Hartney Blues. In the other matchup, the Verdon Oil Kings have a 2-1 series lead over the Killarney Shamrocks. NACI Tigers win final home game of WHSHL regular season by Owen Devereaux and pictured as the NAC T Tigers closed out their regular season home schedule on, Friday, on Sunday, February 27th against the REMP Renegades. The Tigers won the game 3-2. The NACI Tigers closed out their home schedule in style on Sunday, February 27th at the Yellowhead Centre beating the REMP Renegades 3-2. The victory was NACI's 19th of the year and puts them in sixth place in the West, Westman High School Hockey League standings. As for the game itself, it was REMP that started things off on a strong note, scoring less than two minutes into the first period. The Tigers would reply late in the period in a power play opportunity as defenseman Lance Murray scored to make it 1-1, going into the first intermission. The second period saw NACI begin to take total control of the tempo of the play, which paid off with a pair of goals. Brody Pollock scored first on a power play chance within the first four minutes. Jory Kabaki followed that up with what would end up being the game-winning goal. With five, ten, five minutes, ten seconds left in the second, it was his 28th goal and 58th point of the regular season. The Renegades responded late in the third to make it 3-2, but they couldn't find that an all-important equalizer. Tigers goaltender Gatlin Platt played the solid 60 minutes and came away with the well-deserved win between the pipes. The win for NACI was an important one as they had come into the game on a slump, having lost their other two matchups over the weekend. 
The Tigers were defeated by Vincent Mats Massey on Saturday by a score of 4-2. to two. The other game played on Friday was a disappointing 8-2 loss to Dauphin. The NACI Tigers closed out the regular season with a pair of road games. First, they traveled to Gladstone to face the Sandy Bay Badgers on Monday, February 28th. Nipawa would win that game 3-1. Braden Baker, Jory Kalbaki, and Tarek Lapointe scored for the Tigers. Meanwhile, Riley McBride picked up the lone goal for the Badgers. With this win, NACI improved its regular season scoring to 20, 13, and 0, good enough for fifth place in the standings with 43 points on the year. The last tilt of the WHSHL regular season for NACI was Wednesday, March 2nd versus Verdon Golden Bears. The final result in that game was decided after, after the Banner and Press publication deadline. A mystery. Yellowhead Bantam Chiefs defeat, defeat Parkland in Nipua. The Yellowhead female Bantam Chiefs faced the Parkland Rangers at the Yellowhead Centre on Sunday, February 27th. Chiefs scored three goals late in the third period to win 5-3. And here's another article on the Ukrainian crisis. And it's a picture. Nipah resident Brian Gray has put a display in his window showing support for Ukraine and acknowledgement of the current crisis going on in that country. Gray noted that he believes everyone who cares about democracy should speak up and do whatever they can do to support Ukraine and the Canadians of Ukrainian heritage. For a lot of us, it hits really close to home, he expressed. Everything we can do to raise awareness with Canadians, I think, helps. Pictured is a display at Gray's house featuring a Ukrainian flag and the words, Stop Putin. And the Carberry North Cypress Langford news. Community profile, Jaron, Jaron Waldner of Carberry by Gladwin Scott. Jaron Waldner, who is a Carberry Collegiate grade 11 student, will turn 17 in March. He is a high scoring right winger with the GCB Wildcats. Recent statistics indicate 21 goals and 30 assists for 51 points with the second place Wildcats. Last year, Jaron played with the Southwest Cougar, Cougars AAA Bantams. Waldner enjoys power mechanics class and plans to pursue a career in trades after high school graduation. People who have had a positive influence on his development include his parents, Devin and Deanna, Dustin Fisher, Corey Forbes, and Gary Salmon. Jaron has two older siblings, Hayden and Sarah, and two younger ones, Kaylin and Lucy. Here and there, Mott and Creer compete in five-pin bowling provincials, and pictures are Gloria Mott and Ivan Creer of Carberry heading to the five-pin bowling provincials on February 26 by Gladwin Scott. Gloria Mott and Ivan Creer of Carberry have qualified for the five-pin provincial bowling provincials in Carmen Saturday, February 26. Carmen hosted the Westman five-pin bowling qualifier February 18th, with four p teams selected based on above averages. In Carmen, they will bowl eight games and attend the banquet. Provincial representatives will advance to the Nationals in Kelowna, BC after the end of April. Although we're still in the winter sports scene, Baseball Manitoba has announced that Brandon will host MHSAA High School Provincials June 2nd to 4th, the 18 and under AA Provincials July 15th to 17th at Andrews and Summer Fields and the 15 U AAA Provincials July 29th to 31st at Simplot Millennium, Millennium Park. Under 11, under 13, under 15 Prospects Jamboree will be hosted at the Simplot Fields July 22nd to 24th. Coach Chris Unruh's junior varsity basketball team hosted a five-team Saint Laurent, Verdun, Nealon, and Boys of Aine tournament at the Cougar Dome Saturday, February 26. The U.S. women's soccer team won a $24 million lawsuit from the U.S. Soccer Association for equal pay. The women's team has been very successful, including Olympic and World Championships, and has been fighting inequalities for years. Wildcats updates by Gladwin Scott. The Glenborough Carby Balder GCB Wildcats, who have moved into second place in the 18 team Westman High School Hockey League, have two more home games before playoffs. 
Quarterfinals are best of three affairs in the Champions series, series, with one versus eight, two versus seven, three versus six, and four versus five. Teams ranked nine to 16 will compete in the Consolation Series. Many league teams are competitive. The AA Hockey Provincials will be hosted by Russell March 11th to 13th. Three Westman League teams, the Killarney Wawonisa Raiders, the GCB Wildcats and Russell's Major Pratt Trojans will participate in the six-team tournament. Four Wildcat players also play basketball with the Cougars, who plan to play in the A slash AA Junior Varsity Provincials hosted by Birtle March 11th to 13th. Host Sandy Bay Badgers edged the GCB Wildcats 2-1 Thursday. The out visitors outshot the Badgers 55-34 including 25 to 4 in the third period. Trey Dixon assisted by Kylan Aiken and Carson Nakon I'm sorry, Nakachinsky was able to spoil Sandy Bay goal and Keelan Bilyeu's shutout bid with 1 minute left in the game. After a scoreless opening frame, the winners took a 2-1 lead with goals from Riley McBride and Reed Houle. Each team served one penalty in the exciting contest. Paced by out by shootout goals from Elliott brothers Peyton and Carter, the Griff and Griffin Anderson with the winner, the Wildcats defeated McCreary St. Rose Mountaineers 4-3 in Glenboro Saturday. Period scores were 1-1, 3-3, and the third frame in overtime, 4-on-4, four four, were scoreless. Dylan Hood, assisted by Jason Mueller, opened the scoring for the host. Second period markers were recorded by Peyton Elliott and Kylan Aiken and Jaron Waldner, with Terry Dixon drawing the assist. Replying for the visitors were Ryan Benson, Liam Musgrove, and Caden Calmotten with singles. The Mountaineers were outshot 26 to 22. The exciting match had a perfect ending for coach Corey Forbes' 800th game as a Wildcats mentor. A number of his former players were in attendance to recognize and honor this hardworking sports enthusiast who is his 20th season with the team. Way to go, Corey. The Wildcats hosted Crocus Plains in Brandon February 27th and hosted Boys of Ainsuris in Glenboro March 2nd and, lost, and host Crocus in Carberry March 4th. Curling Corner by Gladwin Scott. Pictured is Mike McEwen's Team Manitoba. Pictured from left, Colin Hodgson, Derek Samogoski, Coach Rob Meekin, Reed Carruthers and Mike McEwen. Team Manitoba consisting of Ski Skip Mike McEwen, third Reed Carruthers, second Derek Samogolski, and lead Colin Hodgson will participate in the 2022 Briar in Lethbridge, March 4th to 13th. Competition will be keen with Brad Gushu, Olympic bronze medalist as wildcard one, Brendan Botcher, Canadian champion Kevin Tui, four-time Briar winner, and wildcards Matt Dunstan and Jason Gunlickson among the 18 competitors. Formed in 2018, the McEwen Rink has, as a group has a combined 20 provincial men's titles and were able to wed, edge 21-year-old Ryan Weeb 10-9 in the semi-final and defeat 26-year-old Colton Lott of Winnipeg Beach 8-3 in eight ins in the final to claim the Manitoba crown. Lott has been added to the McEwen Rink as their fifth curler for the Briar. The Manitoba Scotties Tournament of Hearts held in Carberry was successful in many ways. A profit of $74,583 was realized. Money has been donated to date includes Grads 2022 200, Winnipeg Foundation 400, Carberry Child Care Co-op 1984, Christmas Cheer 2855, Cancer Care 300, Junior Curly 1000, Carberry Skating Club 450, Carberry Food Cupboard 1000. The executive has discussed recipients for further donations. Final decisions will be announced in the near future. And here, let's see. Arden hosts Open Bond Spiel Weekend. Pictured from the Arden Bond Spiel, uh, the Arden Curling Club was a buzz of activity last weekend. They held their annual open bond spiel from February 25th to 27th. The club has had an irregular season this year with parts of the season and some bond spiels being canceled due to the pandemic. But the open bond spiel was of their six, one of their successful events. 
Pictured to the left are two of the rinks competing on Sunday, with two adjacent players just happening to throw the rocks at exactly the same time. And above are the winning teams of the three events from the Arden Open Bond Spiel. Left, the winners for the first event were Skip Kevin Paramore, Darla Hankey, Harvey Hankey, and Pat Paramore. Middle, winners of the second event were Skip Darcy Ng, Grant Babcock, Sonova Asselstein, and Joel Asselstein. Right, the winners of the third event were Skip Michelle Babcock, Craig Johnson, Shannon Plett, and Mandy Johnson. And that pretty much concludes the paper for March 4th. There's a few other letters to the editor that can be investigated, but there are lots starting to happen. We're headed into spring, and I think there's going to be a lot more news coming up. Hope you have a, have a really good weekend.